Hey, we're Chelsea and Tony, and you're watching our audio and video podcast, Picture This. And today we're going to be talking about the history of Leica. But first, before we go over the Leica history, we have some interesting stories about them. We're going to review their cameras. But first, we have to tell you that this episode is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is the easiest way to create a beautiful website, blog, or online store for you and your ideas. Squarespace features an elegant interface, beautiful templates, and incredible 24-7 customer support. So try Squarespace at squarespace.com slash Tony. And if you use the coupon code PORTFOLIO, you'll get 10% off. Thanks for sponsoring us, Squarespace. You can use Squarespace to set up like any type of website. It's super easy. You don't have to be nerdy, but it will give you awesome results that look good on yeah. mobile devices, computers, without you worrying about plugins or You can see CSS mine at chelseanorthrup.com. I was just going over it today, tweaking some things. You can go look at it, give me some feedback if you want. Yeah. I'm at Northrup Photography, and you no, can no, actually no, buy no. prints there. Go to mine. You can, because it comes with the store built it's into it. I don't try it's to cheap. Check it out. Thank you, Squarespace. Uh, let's get into the Leica history. First, I want to start with the name because it's such a fancy pants brand. And I was like, where did this name come from? It is a combination between the founder's name, Ernst Lights, and camera. It was called Lights Camera, so they combined it. Leica Lights Camera. I wouldn't I have guessed that. That just seems like pretty simple, right? And lots of brands did that with the ka at the end. Yashica? Like Yashica. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's a really weird convention. We don't do that now. It's not like our all car companies end with ka at the end. I guess that would be the same syllable. That's a bad example. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I liked it. I thought you did a good job. Tell me about the first camera. So this is when Leica got founded. About around 1914, um, Oscar was making this prototype for the Leica, and it was a solid metal body with a collapsible lens. So they didn't have interchangeable lenses yet um, and had no overlapping curtain. And, um, and it was just pretty simple. It was a pretty basic camera, but it was a 35 millimeter that you could bring into the field. So it wasn't this huge camera. It was small. It was compact. Yeah. And easy. They had been, uh, the lights company had been making microscopes. Like yeah. by this time, they'd manufactured over 100,000 microscopes. They were huge. <laughs> yeah. So this was kind of their, their first camera. And they took uh, like film for cinematography. And instead of running it through vertically, you know how vid film would go from top to bottom? Yeah. They ran it through horizontally. That was them. Going from like, 18 by 24 to 36 by 24. Do you know why they picked the three to two ratio? Os Oscar Barnack, I think, picked it. Oscar? He, he liked it. He just liked it? He just liked it. <laughs> he just thought it was aesthetically pre pleasing, that three to two ratio. But I'm, I'm dwelling on this because that three to two ratio and the 24 by 36 millimeter format is still what we use today. That's what our D810 has. This is what our 5DSR has. It's historically the most popular format and it's largely due to him using it. Using this cinematography 35 millimeter film just run through the other way. A big historic moment. Yeah, except this, hadn't actually, this didn't actually go into production until like nine years later. Um, they came out with a production model and it was slightly updated and uh, it was something that the public could get their hands on. So it was revealed March 1925 at the Leipzig Spring Fair. And it had not, it was non interchangeable lenses. It just had a fixed 50 millimeter lens. Um, but like I said, it was compact, it was 35 millimeter. And so that was their first camera that was available to the public. Yeah, and this was uh, a, a pretty difficult time for them because, you know, they were coming out of World War One, And the original Ernst Lights died and left the company to his sons. That doesn't always work out well. No, but I think it worked out, it worked out pretty well, well for, for Leica. So they, they took over uh, the company in a difficult time. Um, but they did a really good job. And, and I think one of the things that set them apart from other companies is they treated their employees really, really well. 
yeah. and ridiculously well. We'll see as we get into history a little bit further. I think it's interesting because we've gone over uh, Nikon's history. We did Canon's history as well and, uh, Fuji. and Fuji's. And it's just interesting to see how the world wars influenced each company. Because you don't really think of that when you think of war. They don't show how it impacted every part of every industry. But the camera industry was profoundly impacted because they needed optics for the war. So every camera company ended up kind of doing something different because of the war. It's cool to see how it shapes all of these companies. Yeah, and it's not entirely coincidental that all the big camera manufacturers now, almost all of them, are either German or Japanese. Bringing it home, to T North. <laughs> <laughs> the Leica 2. Yeah, the Leica 2. So in 1932, they came out with a camera with interchangeable lenses. So finally, you're not, you don't just have that 50 millimeter fixed lens. You can put different lenses on it. Uh, and that's good for the company. That's a good idea. You're not just selling someone a camera and film and walking away. You're selling someone different lenses. You have more products to put out. And it's good for photographers. Yeah, and, and they're popular. Yeah. And they're popular because they're compact and portable. They're they're almost like the first kind of portable camera because there were lots of cameras out there. Some were cheaper, but most were, were bigger and bulkier. And they were well made with great optics because of the company's background in microscopes. And as a result, they had everybody trying to rip them off because there wasn't a whole lot of respect for like the copyright and patents and design yeah. and such. So, you know what Canon was doing? about this time was making like a ripoff bodies <laughs> with the exact same amount and Nikon, Nikon was... almost the same amount Nikon making ripoff lenses, right? Yes. That's what they were doing. Yeah. But Leica was the one people wanted. Mm -hmm. So you might've bought Canon or Nikon gear, but only cause you didn't have the money for the Leica. They were internationally respected for this. I still don't have the money for the Leica. Um, and then Right, I know. I want one. <laughs> Usually, we have a couple models of the camera yeah, displayed here, like, but here it's is the painful. air where our Leica should be. We have used them and such, but to actually buy them is is difficult. Even for professionals, it's painfully well, we expensive. Have... Even old ones, old ones are sometimes even more expensive. Yeah. Oh, I really want a Leica. They're so expensive, though. I don't know. Maybe Santa will bring you one. He's not going to. <laughs> uh, so they're based in. Germany and we're moving into the 40s now and is there anything interesting that well it starts the in the 30s actually yeah because uh, Hitler is appointed the Chancellor of Germany and Jewish people start coming to uh, lights the second and saying we're really nervous. Hitler's in power. There's a lot of tension. You know people are acting out against the Jews and so he just starts hiring people uh, and he's giving Jewish people jobs and Jewish people are refugees. They're being forced from their homes and he's reacting to this political climate where the Jewish people are not being treated very well. So he's giving people jobs. He's training them so he can send them to facilities outside of the country. And then something happens. Uh, Kristallnacht, Christ the night of broken glass, I believe it translates to um, a a. Polish Jewish teenager assassinates a German official and people lose their minds. He has a note on him when he gets caught assassinating him in Paris and basically admits, you know, I have to do this for the Jewish people. Uh, the Nazi party is hurting and killing Jewish people and I have to do this in the name of the Jews. And so people respond with Kristallnacht, with his going out and just shattering all of the glass of Jewish-owned stores, Jewish-owned homes, wow. synagogues are burned, and glass is just beaten out of the windows. And so then everyone's in a panic, um, and Leipzig lights the second. Not Leipzig lights the second just responds by doubling down on this effort to get a lot of Jewish people to safety. So he's he's training them and then he's sending them to the United States with their families and getting them out of Germany, he's sending them to other countries where Leica is based and he's giving them jobs and uh, he's giving them cameras and he's making sure that his employees and associates in other countries are helping out the families and the refugees. And he saved, they don't know exactly how many Jews he saved, but hundreds if not more, he's kind of known as like 
a Schindler-esque person. Yeah, and it's interesting that everybody knows Schindler's List. Yeah. But not many people know this story. I didn't know the story before I started researching this podcast. I think it was 1967 that a writer from Reader's Digest uh, contacted, I think, Ernst Leitz III or, or one of the yeah. his children, one of his sons, and said, we want to do a story about this. And the son said, not in my lifetime. Why he was still afraid of the backlash? No, uh, that's not, at least that's not the explanation he gave. His explanation was, I can't, we can't take credit for this because a lot of people did things like this. A lot of people were there helping people. It was the only decent and human thing to do. And if we take credit for it, then it's not fair because all those other people aren't getting credit. That's the way he felt. He the way I take it is he was very modest about his family doing this and didn't want to be like braggy. He certainly didn't want to profit for him from it by, you know, making it part of the reputation. So there was nothing, as far as I know, there's nothing to be ashamed of, but he just didn't want to take credit for it. Now it's a weird thing because at the time, Leica was working for the Nazis. Yeah. They were manufacturing things for the Nazis. That yeah, is just about every German business. Wasn't was. Lights even a part of the Nazi party? And then he was kicked out? Uh, I don't know that. Confirm internet. There um, is a lot more to the story that, you know, we want to do like their overall history. I think we could do an entire podcast on this part of the like a history alone. Yeah. Um, but you'll have to look into that more. Maybe we'll save it for another day. But, uh, yeah, well, it, it's fascinating, and they, they definitely saved a lot of lives while at the same time working closely with the Germans. And uh, it's re reported that the Nazis did know about some of what he was doing, and they weren't happy with it. Yeah, but there was a the Gestapo time, spy in their factory, and some people got in trouble, but they did not punish lights because they needed, they needed like a, they were using the company. Right. So was it okay that he was working for the Nazis? Did he have any other choice? What would the outcome be if he had simply refused? He did use what power he had, not unlike Schindler, to do what good he could in an impossibly difficult situation. Yeah. Um, one of the cameras that they produced during this time was the Luftwaffe Leica. Luftwaffe. The Luftwaffe is just a general German word meaning Air Force. They also made cameras for like their army and navy. Um, but of course, the Air Force in particular like taking surveillance pictures and that kind of thing. Um, these are extremely valuable today if you were to try to pick one up. There, there was only a couple thousand made, but tens of thousands have been sold. <laughs> you know why? Yeah, because they're worth money, so people make fake ones. Yeah, they just make fake ones. Yeah. Um, and there, there's almost none around uh, that have the proper engravings on them because they were engravings, but people would file off the engravings or because they didn't want Luftwaffe written on it after the war because they weren't exactly, they didn't want to be associated with the whole Nazi uh, thing. Interesting. Um, so these are certainly collector's items. Yeah. Like a so lot of Leica's are. That's a lot of what Leica was doing. They were also just, uh, you know, the Nazis just had them manufacturing weapons. Um, and even now you can go to their factory and they'll show you the tunnels underneath. The, the town had been mining iron ore. So there were a series of tunnels and the allies were bombing them and stuff. So they moved a lot of the operations underground so they could kind of continue working. Um, the, the Leica, the quality of the Leicas from this period went down sharply, um, largely because the Nazis took their best talent and reassigned them to other tasks, including actually working on the German atomic bomb effort. Uh, so they lost a lot of their talent during this period. Um, there were some damage done to some of their factories. Uh, at least one remained stand, uh, con continue to stand. And I, I read this. I don't. You, you. It's hard to really know the truth about something that happened during World War II. But they say that Eisenhower was a big fan of Leica, and he actually directed the Allied bombings to not hit the factory. Because they dropped bombs close enough that they shattered the windows in the factory, but didn't destroy it. But that was a key moment in the history of Leica. Because you think they knew? Like, they're like, guys, not this one. 
Yeah, it seems like there's somebody just whisper in the bomber's ear, like just just a hundred yards off to the side. It seems like a weird way to conduct a bombing operation. <laughs> Why not just skip the bombing entirely? Or I I don't know. That's just what I read. I can I can't talk to the bomber. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's impossible. Uh, one of the well, so Zeiss. Zeiss was a competing company at the time making glass, and. Zeiss happened to be on the side of Germany that Russia ended up claiming as they were also fighting with the allies and Russia and the U S handled kind of post-war victory differently. Russia came in and basically claimed most of the equipment, Zeiss's equipment and factories as post-war reparations. So they said, hmm, we spent a lot on this war. You need to make it up for, from it for us. So we're going to take a bunch of this equipment. They cleaned Zeiss out, closed them down completely. Wow. Um, the Americans, on the other hand, uh, liked Leica cameras and immediately gave them orders, like ordered cameras from them to produce for like the U S military men and stuff. Not unlike what Canon and Nikon did post well, Canon, what Canon did post-war producing cameras for the, uh, the army who was stationed there at the time. Why am I, I'm blanking on the word. What do you call it when an army is encamped in a town? Occupied, the al occupying allied forces. Um, so that gave Leica a distinct post-war advantage and is a big part of why they were so successful. Um, yeah, that would be tough for Zeiss to bounce back from something like that. And Leica at the time was the camera to have. Like I said, everybody else was just making Leica ripoffs. Everybody wanted a Leica and they just had an impeccable reputation. But the camera game was kind of changing because there was this new innovation, uh, the single lens reflex camera. Different yeah. types of SLRs had been around for some time, but Leica had specifically been making these rangefinder cameras. And talk about the design of rangefinders a little bit. They actually kind of have two lenses. So you have a separate lens that you hold up to your eye and you look through it. And it will probably have a couple of boxes in there marking different focal lengths. So it might be like 24 millimeters when you hold it up, but then there'll be yeah. a box for 50. And if you put on a 50 millimeter lens, you know that you have to use the little box. It's a strange system if you haven't used it. And then when you go to focus, the, the lens has this mechanism that links it to the viewfinder. So you can see when it's in focus and they're, they're separate, but linked and when it works, it works. You can properly focus. <laughs> when it works, it works. But it, even modern Leicas are prone to slipping a little bit. So the lens and the viewfinder will become a, come a little out of focus and you won't discover this until you get a roll of film developed and everything is out of focus. And then you know what you do, you send the camera back to the Leica factory in Germany and they align everything and then send it back to you at pretty great cost. <laughs> and that is still the story with like a rangefinder cameras as they're manufactured today, they've gotten better, but they have to be realigned on a regular basis and you still have to send them back to Germany. So it, it leads to some missed shots. It leads to some unreliability and it leads to a high cost of ownership. It's a for camera these lovers camera. It's like people that own classic cars. It's never a more affordable, easier option to have a beautiful classic car. You're always going to have to put a little more work into it, but it's a driver's car. It's about the experience. Yeah. So the, the benefits of this system were it could be very compact because you didn't need like a big mirror mechanism like an SLR has, and it could be quiet too. Uh, but you had this kind of missed shots thing going on. You had slippage. You weren't, cause you weren't actually looking through the lens like you do with an SLR. Yeah. Um, and Leica saw the SLR game coming and but they had a really weird solution and in 1951 they released the visoflex which uh camera collectors describe as some sort of rube goldberg nightmare you can take a like a rangefinder camera and put this big contraption on the front of it and over it and it includes all the components of an slr so it has a mirror in there and then it has a separate lens mount and you buy you separate press lenses this for it to press the shutter. Yeah. It has a mechanism to move the mirror out of the way and push the shutter at the same time. You know, if you're listening to this podcast 
We're going to have to put a picture of this thing up. Yeah, so if, if you have ever played that mousetrap game when you were a kid, it's kind of like taking pictures with that. <laughs> it's this really complex and expensive really? <laughs> thing to tack onto okay. a rangefinder camera and kind of make it like an SLR. It was not a huge hit. No, I would guess that. <laughs> <laughs> but this was kind of their first, this was them acknowledging that SLRs solved a lot of the rangefinder problems and had practical purposes but now they made this big and clumsy camera out of their small and elegant camera kind of the worst of both worlds but they did eventually come out with an slr um they did yeah but not yet but not yet and then in about 54 came the m3 so the M3 is like the like a lot of people talk about. It's super well constructed, uh, widely adapted, really popular camera. Yeah, it's just this is the Leica everybody wants. The M3 yeah. is iconic just because it was it became such a famous camera, uh, largely because from you know fifty four onward through the eighties, it was widely adopted by war photographers, street photographers, Henri Carré, yeah. Besson, and people saw the most respected professionals using these things. Uh, and the later M series cameras deserve a lot of that credit, but I think the M3 is kind of the turning point. It was just such a beautiful and well-made camera. And that's great. But in 1959, Nikon announced the F mount. Oh. And this changed everything. Yeah, this was a big deal for Nikon. We covered this in our Nikon history podcast, so you'll have to listen to that one too and get some crossover. Yeah, it's the same amount they use today, basically. Yeah, yeah. And up until now, Nikon had just been making like a knockoff stuff. But now they made their own original camera and it was an SLR. And it solved all those little nitpicky rangefinder problems because it might miss focus. I mean, it was still manual focus and all that, but you could see it because you were looking through the lens. Did that also, oh, you can just see it through the lens, okay. Yeah, light comes through the lens, hits a mirror, bounces up to a prism, hits your eye. So what you see is what you get. And for professionals, that was really worth it, even though it was bigger and bulkier and not as well made. Do you suppose that the time it was like any photography advancement now where people are like, pros don't need to see what they're gonna get? <laughs> like a real pro doesn't need that. Yeah, probably so. And a lot of people didn't switch over. A lot of people continued using rangefinder cameras. Of course, they still do. But uh, especially for things like the Olympics, where critical focusing was critical and there was no <laughs> going back and doing it again. Yeah. SLRs took it, as specifically the Nikon F mounts. And so pros left and right switched to the Nikon F mount from Leica. And it kind of forever changed Leica's business. Um, and Leica, they they have always been pretty cutting edge. They've always been pretty quick to adapt. They kind of missed this one, but they did release the Leica Flex in 1964. But it maybe it wasn't their best camera. And I think Nikon had already made a lot of headway and Nikon prices were much lower too. Like a SLRs, they aren't known for SLRs. Yeah. They still make SLRs, but they're really known for those rangefinder cameras. But now Nikon is basically eating their lunch. Nikon's on top, the person they'd been copying, they're, they're really winning. Um, 1968, the Leica Flex SL. Yeah, it was the first one with the through the lens spot exposure metering. Um, so that was an advancement. I think it was the first camera to have that. So they tried to up their game a little bit. 1984, the M6, it had the through the lens exposure metering, it had an LED viewfinder display, and it still had that beautiful classic M body that everybody liked. Yeah, still that same rangefinder design, still all those same lenses. I know people that lenses. love these. Oh yeah, all those M Is cameras. Is this the one you want? Uh, I don't know, there's so many good <laughs> I'm gonna historic I'm gonna get you lenses. the one just with the SLR attachment. That's what I want to get you. Uh, you think, but you look up anything like on eBay, you still can't buy this stuff. <laughs> you can't. It just becomes really expensive. Uh, 1986, the lights company officially becomes Leica at this point. Up until now, Leica has just been the brand they use for cameras. Mm. Um, but they're like, everybody knows the name Leica. Nobody knows the name lights. So lights just became Leica. 
Um, they came out with the first digital camera in 1996, and it was the S. Their first digital camera. Yeah, their first digital camera. Sorry, uh, and it was the S1. Um, it, had, it was a scanning camera, so you had to keep it really still on that's, a tripod. That's 25 megapixels. That's actually a huge megapixel well, camera. But because it was, you know, it wasn't a typical camera that you could hold up. It didn't have a typical sensor. It was scanning things, and you had to have it. It took a long time to scan anything. So you had to put it, uh, like, it could be used for still lives or in a studio. Product but photography, it, probably. Yeah, product photography, but, you know, it wasn't widely adapted. And it used those lenses. It looked weird as heck, too. Yeah, strange. And then in 1996, they came out with the R8. It was a hybrid. And in 2004, they came out with a digital back that went on that. I like the look of it. It looks like muscular, right? Like it's got like huge shoulders. It's beefy. <laughs> yeah, I like it. It makes beautiful cameras. Another M, the first digital one in 2006, the M8, which like a, with their digital rangefinder cameras has really tried to stay true to their whole history mm -hmm. in that they the cameras feel almost identical. <laughs> They're really low on the electronic stuff. Like they don't tend to provide a whole lot of high-end features. Yeah. And they, you know, they are all like all metal and even kind of harsh, sharp edges in the hand, just because they stick with that design. It, it even beautiful. had the, like it didn't use a mirrorless style electronic viewfinder. It had like a traditional optical viewfinder. You still send it back to Germany <laughs> to get it tuned every now and then. One unusual thing about the M8 is that it actually had a smaller sensor than the usual 35 millimeter format. Yeah, it was like APS-H, like one point three times, which yeah. was some of the other Canon and Nikon cameras use that format too, just because making a full frame sensor was, even for Leica, <laughs> was prohibitively expensive. Um, and Leica continued just making pretty awesome cameras throughout the year. None of them ever became as popular as the Canon and Nikon cameras, but they were more targeting like the high end pro market and to a large extent like Leica enthusiasts. You know what I mean? Like, if you like a Leica, that's what you want. It's not necessarily, they never compared well. So the pixel peepers, the people who love features, they never fought evenly there. They were never the best value, Yeah. but they were Leicas. They always had that Leica thing about them. They always felt like a Leica. Uh, yeah, so 2008, the S2 was a medium format SLR and a fantastic beautiful camera with a huge sensor, also fantastically priced. Fantastically priced, like really expensive or like a good deal? Really expensive. <laughs> That's <what I'm> <laughs> Just clarifying. <laughs> they came out with a compact digital too, and I think that they were actually trying to back away from that super expensive stuff and appeal more to the consumer market with the X1 in 2009. So it was a compact camera. Um, 12 megapixels. I don't actually know how much it was though, but it wasn't to be, it wasn't to be compared with their professional stuff. Yeah. Like it's been interesting because they have this revered brand and mm -hmm. they make, do make very expensive cameras, but at the same time, they're not snobs about it. They happily make uh, lower end compact cameras. It's just that they're still known for the high end stuff. And as we move into the more modern era, we'll see lots of interesting non Leica ish projects that they work on. Uh, in 2014, they reopened a factory in Wetzlar, Germany, where the original factories had been like oh, during World cool. War II, the ones that survived. Um, so this is what's on top of those tunnels now. And it's beautiful. It's actually like the interior of it is stunning. It is designed to look like a lens, like the I factory was thinking itself. That. It looks like a lens. Yeah, it, it looks absolutely beautiful. Uh, we should take a minute and talk about our sponsor, Squarespace. We should. Squarespace... Thank you for making this episode possible. Tony and I use Squarespace. We both have portfolios. You don't have to worry about his, but you can check out mine at ChelseaNorthrop.com. Just kidding. What's yours? NorthropPhotography.com. Um, and you can get one of your own. You can go to Squarespace.com slash Tony, and you can get a 14-day free trial, no credit card needed, and just try it. See if you like it. You don't even have to buy it, but I think you're going to like it. Starts at really low prices, like $9.99 or something a month. And you can get 10% off if you use our coupon code portfolio. That also lets Squarespace know we're doing a good job. We're making them sound great. 
kind of do that on their own. Squarespace is great for any type of website, uh, even if you not don't want to like display your photography. Mm -hmm. But for example, Justin, what's one job that could benefit from a Squarespace website? <laughs> Justin on the spot. Uh, taxidermist. Taxidermies, exactly. You could even display pictures of the things you taxidermy. What's wrong with our employees? Last time Siobhan said mortician. <laughs> I just like making people come up with a job quickly. It's They're actually dark. shockingly ha They're hard dark. to come up with a job. A contractor, a doctor, a lawyer. If you want people to come to your website and say, hey, this person is modern and fresh and knows what they're doing, get a beautiful Squarespace website. That's Thanks it. for sponsoring us, Squarespace. Check them out. And I want to see I, t some taxidermy on Squarespace. Just very, like, modern squirrel. If you want to have fun, this is off topic. But go to eBay and search for taxidermy. Or even search for bad taxidermy. Because there's a lot of creative taxidermy on eBay. It's Great Christmas art. gifts. It's an art. A little, <laughs> a little weird art. Yeah, you might find a squirrel wearing a hat in your stocking this year, Chelsea. I hope I do. I really hope I do. 2013... Leica releases the Leica C, which is a Panasonic LF1 rebranded with the look Leica. Well, now, okay. Leica has a long modern relationship with Panasonic. They've been making Leica branded lenses for them. And in fact, some of the lenses we're filming on today say Leica on them. They're mm. Panasonic, but supposedly they're engineered by Leica. And I never really understood the how deep this relationship was we like, need to go to the factory yeah are they actually doing the engineering work or are they just kind of selling their brand um i'll say we just like every other camera system we have mixed results it's not like every panasonic lens that's branded leica performs stellar some of them are quite mediocre yeah but when i look at reviews online I see so many people about these lenses saying this lens has that fantastic Leica quality. And that speaks oh. to the value of the Leica brand. Do you think that that is really true or it's like wine and people just think it has a fancy label so they like it? It's definitely a lot like wine because we we test a lot of lenses and some of these lenses are not amazing. But when people see that Leica on there, they feel like they're amazing. And that's actually okay because it's not all about sharpness or whatever. It's mm. about fun. It's about feeling yeah, good about it. But there can be a quality to a lens because I've definitely compared different lenses and one will be technically a little better, but I like the softness or I just like the way the background blur is or the, you know, yeah, I like and the qualities of the lens. I think a lot of the Leica value is impossible to measure like that. Yeah. So we see something similar in 2014. They released the Velux, which has all the specs you want, like 4K video, Wi-Fi, NFC, which is, a, it took me back when Leica released a camera with all these features. And then you realize it's also a rebranded Panasonic FZ1000. And you'll see a handful of kind of rebranded mm. Panasonic cameras like this. They put them in. I do like the Panasonic cameras, though. Panasonic does make good cameras. Leica just kind of takes the guts and the optics and puts it in like a nice case, a nice body. They beef it up a little they're good bit. At that. Yeah. And they raise the, the price while they're at it. What? Uh, in 2014, an interesting camera that does seem to be like a design, though it's hard to know for sure, the Leica T. Um, this is a low price point for them at $1,850. It's a, a fixed lens camera, but it has. Well, it has a kind of a unique shape, but still reminiscent of that M. Yeah, it's very and, modern. It's beautiful. Yeah, just a, a really beautiful design. I'll say it's only a couple of years old, but it didn't get great reviews. And the reviews point out places that you might think like it wouldn't do great at. Things like the app doesn't work great and the Wi-Fi connection doesn't work great. And yeah. no camera manufacturer is great at that stuff. But like a, being like such a, a traditional company, um, maybe didn't nail those high tech things. But they're I, in it. I'd love if somebody did nail it. that. Yeah. They're still known Fine for their reason. range finders, but they're not afraid to change for the modern era. And in many ways, they've done a better job than Canon, Nikon, Fuji, or any of these other companies. And we'll get to that in a second. 2015, the Leica Q, which I think, oh man, there are so many Leicas that I want. Look how beautiful, really beautiful. this Leica Q is, um, especially the one with the, like the, the gray. <laughs> I like that even it more. It matches your hair. Um, it has a fixed lens, and um, it 
it really uh, has like that Leica M body. Yeah. So you can really feel like you're using a Leica. Uh, one of our favorite cameras of all time, the 2015 Leica SL. $6,600 for the body alone. So if you put a lens on it, you're definitely looking at five figures, but it's a 35 millimeter mirrorless camera and it's pretty high tech in every way and has this shutter that just goes like, Krithunk. oh, I love an SL. Is this the one that we used at Photo Plus? Yeah. Yeah. We've used them at a couple of different trade shows because whenever I'm at a trade show and I see it, I go and I just touch all the it like and stuff. I love it. And <laughs> you love it. Yeah. I can't bring myself to buy it. I can't either. We certainly have cameras worth six grand, but you know, it's a lot. I'm not cool enough. Um, and in 2016, Huawei, the Huawei P9 is a smartphone. Yeah. See, they're like trying to get in there with the modern times. Yeah. Things are changing cameras. People aren't buying as many cameras because smartphones are taking over. And I don't know of any other camera company that has partnered with smartphone manufacturers like this. So Leica is probably the only one who has a foot in the smartphone game partnering with Huawei to make this novel dual lens design and frankly lend some of their branding to it to make people feel like the smartphone camera like is it better. has really good branding. They really it's do. They are very... the most respected camera company. Yeah. I, at least in my opinion. Uh, like I said, we don't use all their gear because we're very results oriented, but Leica has more value in their brand than any other well, company. We do a different kind. We're not photojournalists or street photographers. Yeah. I, nobody really does say wildlife photography <laughs> with like, as that's not their yeah. specialty. It's a type of photography. Um, anyway, I'm excited that Leica is staying relevant and they're not afraid to try new things. And I feel like Leica has a, a rich, history going forward too. I feel like they're actually more progressive than most of the other camera companies, despite being one of the most old and storied companies around. Thanks, Leica. Uh, this episode, to wrap up, is brought to you by Squarespace. Well, Tony, how do you feel about Squarespace? I like Squarespace. It wasn't that long ago that we talked about them, but if you want your own Squarespace <laughs> website, go to squarespace.com slash Tony, get a 14 day free trial, no credit card required. And if you like it, Use the coupon code portfolio to yeah. save yourself 10%. Get 10% off your taxidermy website. Show the world all those squirrels. Uh, you can hear this either on YouTube or in your podcasting app. I think it's better listen to, it to you listen drive. to you while you drive yeah. or you clean or. Yeah, because it's long format. It's long format. You know, we get a little chatty, but that's okay. It's a podcast. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Like, share, subscribe. Bye.